uh, and there was a, it would pearl at the eyes and it would stream. And so for a few years, it, it was a, a miraculous cycle. Mm. So people would come from all over to see it. Um, and so one of the things that's that important is that, you know, especially on the online Orthodox world, you have this kind of ideal of what Orthodoxy is and this ideal of what iconography is. And people kind of live in a, in a bit of a like a bit of a dream, and it's fine to have an ideal in the sense that this is what we're aiming towards, and we know why we're aiming towards it, but the reality of, of orthodoxy, like all kinds of things, is that it, there's there's all, all kinds of influences, there's a mixed bag, there's all kinds of things that happen in the history. And so when people say that, you know, orthodox churches, they have icons, but they don't have anything that looks like Western paintings, that is not true. Like, it's actually not true in practice. So you can see some of these images are very much like images that you would see in a, in a Catholic church, you know, and at some points in, this, in the history, especially late 19th century, sometimes beginning of the 20th century, this was quite normal. So people will tell you, oh, Orthodox people don't have stained glass. Well, stained glass, you look at some of the paintings, you know, there are some that have that very traditional Stands where you have Saint Pantelaimon, for example, who's standing. You know, he looks he looks very much. Although there is a definitely a kind of Western influence, he looks like very much like an icon. But then you have an image of Christ, I think, walking on the waters over there. You know, you know, Christ doesn't have the, the, the cruciform halo, uh, and so there are aspects of it that really, you know, maybe the people who made it were Anglican. I don't know, but there is this sense like you can see that there's a transition in terms of of the iconography. There are a few other things, like the fact that some of the saints have crosses in their halos. Uh, you know, it, those were probably made by uh, people that are not Orthodox, I think. That's true. Uh, in fact, the windows were made by a business who, uh, these people, it was a family business. They were Cuban heritage. They were not uh, religious in any way. I thought they, were, they might have been Catholic, but they, they were not. And, uh, and they said they didn't even go to church. So, you know, they did made an approximation of what we wanted, and they did pretty good. And we love these windows, uh, especially in the second story. You know, these scenes can be a Christian church. Uh, they did beautifully done. They came from Atlanta, Georgia. They were not important. They were important for the world. They were important. <laughs> and the glass came from Kokomo, Indiana. Still a big producer of opalescent art glass. Uh, we're really proud of them. I can't imagine the space without them. They're with the light and color. Uh, so, just so therapeutic in my mind. About 11 years old. I love this piece. And this small skin in a light ball. Uh, and this was completed in 2006. Uh, the visit of Patriarch Bartholomew, who came in 2006 to commemorate a hundred years of the Epiphany celebration here from 1906. So, I mean, the church has a very traditional you know, version in terms of the architecture of the Orthodox Church. A dome on a square or on a cross shape. Uh, I mean, it's a, just a very classic uh, structure. And you can see that now, like you can, what we talked about before, so now there is a tendency in iconography, in Greece especially, to kind of go back to the ancient models. You know, now there are all these artists who have learned to paint icons, and they're, you know, because of all the, let's say, all of the chaos that happened in the 20th century, you can see that the tendency now is to go back to the earlier images, 14th century, 16th century, way of painting. Um, and so here we have the miracle, two miracles of Christ with some saints. This piece here is about healing. So on this side, the inscription reads that Christ is healing those with We have the image of the evangelist, and then it means to say Mark has the lion, John has the Attribution. Sometimes you'll just have 
the saint. And then sometimes, for example, there's a church in Greenville now that just did their dome. And they just actually put the, 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 the beast. And so they're different traditions. Um, and the oldest tradition is, of course, to have Christ in the dome. But in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, the tendency to put God the Father up there it became quite prominent. So when you go to Mount Athos, you will see God the Father up in the dome. It's something that happens. And this is, it's important to notice this because you'll, you'll meet Orthodox people online. They'll tell you, we never represent God the Father. God the Father is not part of the iconography. And that is just not true. Again, it's not true in practice. And although there are reasons to say that it's preferable to have Christ in the dome, and you can explain it theologically, you have to be careful to think that, you know, the Orthodox Church is this like pure thing that's always the same, that nothing ever changes, that it's just, just one thing and everybody thinks the same. It's just absolutely, that's not actually how life functions, right? It, all, except for the online imaginary world. <laughs> but, but in real life, and so, you know, the, the image of God the Father represented with a triangle as a halo is one that you find in the Western tradition, a way to kind of distinguish him. The origin of this image at first, it was this image of the Ancient of Days, which is represented in the book of Daniel. And so, the, you know, in the thir 13th century, late 12th, maybe like 13th century, this image starts to appear. The, uh, the first kind of defenses of it is that, you know, it's like an old version of Christ, so we can show Christ as an old man. And so it's still the incarnation, which is showing us God the Father. This becomes a little tricky, you know, and then in Russia, there's a whole battle like I mean there's council after councils and people fighting over whether or not this this image is acceptable in iconography or not and most iconographers today won't represent this image you know just to avoid confusion about you know who are representing how can we represent God but these exist and, you know I don't see a reason to, to paint over them or tear them down they're part of our of our of our tradition they're part of a moment between the holy place, you know, and the outer place, but then also showing how we cross through, right? You know, like Christ has opened the door. So we have to never forget the difference. This is, you know, you hear people say, why do you have this big separation? You know, why, didn't Christ rip the veil, right? Didn't he just completely separate things? And the answer is, of course he did. But he didn't do it in a way that flattened the world. He did it in a way to give us access, but we always have to remember that even though we have access to the holiest thing, it's still the holiest thing. It's not the same as eating donuts and drinking coffee, right? And so we have to be able to both maintain the hierarchy, maintain the separation, but then also show to what extent now this is open and available to us and kind of coming down. 
down into our lives. So it's important to remember that because in the, you know, even in the Orthodox Church, there's a tendency to want to kind of eliminate this, kind of reduce it to, to nothing because of that, you know, that, that, that image that in some ways the hierarchy is gone in the church, but there's always a balance, right? A balance between the openness and also remembering, like what's back there is the origin of the world, right? What's back there is not, you know, what comes down and what we present to the people is not to be trifled with, right? It'll burn you, it's, it's no joke. I've heard Orthodox priests say, you know, say, if you're not Orthodox, don't come up to com for communion, and they say, that, I'm saying this for your protection. And I, I want you to understand this to protect you. It's not, it's not just to protect you, it's also to protect you. Because what, what, you know, what comes into that space is the, is the origin of the world. So we have to remember that. The ways of representing is to have Mother of God and Christ in the action. So if you think about it, uh, with Christ in the dome, I mean, here we don't have Christ in the dome, but think about it with Christ in the dome, with the Mother of God here, you have these two, uh, these two aspects of Christ that, that I've mentioned several times, which is on the one hand, Christ that is hidden in creation, or that is, that is peeking through the world, right? At the nativity, Christ comes down into the cave, and is hidden from, it's like a mystery, a treasure to be found. And then also, Christ coming as the, as the heavenly man, coming as the, the one who is the judge of all reality. So those two in, in balance is what we need to understand the mystery of Christianity. Um, and there's also a very powerful structure, which is that, and it's in some ways the structure of the ascension icon. So you have Christ above, and then below is the church, is that gathering together. Summit between heaven and earth, she in some way stands for that whole reality kind of gathering into herself as well. And so, and so back there you have the fathers of the church, you kind of see them, bishops, sometimes there's a tree hierarchy, you have a whole range of, of, of icons of the, of the theologian, 